In January 2005, Christian Retailing named Mart Green one of the top 50 people who have most impacted and shaped Christian retailing in the last century. And that's just one of many awards of excellence for uh, well, so many things. I hope we can touch on most of them today. What a pleasure uh, to meet the man probably, probably best known for Hobby Lobby. Good to meet you. Nice to meet you. It's exciting to be here today. Welcome from Oklahoma. Yeah, yeah, we're up north here and enjoying our time here in Toronto. Now, I am sure, although you aren't in Canada yet, yet. with Hobby Lobby, <laughs> that everybody's heard of this uh, amazing, really, uh, it, it's a whole succession of uh, companies, enterprises, but best known for the arts and crafts, um, not something you're particularly personally interested in, Mart. But the story of this business is just one of those sweet success stories. Give us, give us the short version. Yeah, well, I was nine years old when the story started for me. That was 1970. My dad worked for a five and dime store. I uh, met my mom at 17. They got married at 17 and 19, and my dad just loved working retail. And so his passion was retail. But it got to the point that he was only getting two days a month off every other Sunday. So he worked seven days, six days, seven. And so he thought, well, maybe he'd start his own business on the side. And so since he was working so much, really my mom started the business. And so he had to go to the bank. They borrowed $600. And we actually glued frames first. And so the name of that company was Greco. My dad had a partner named Pico, and our name was Green. Oh, so cute. Greco, and we glued frames. So me and my brother got paid seven cents to glue frames. My mom ran the business. A blind guy cut the frames. And then we took them down to several palsy, and they would glue them, and me and my brother. And we just, then a, sales guy, a salesman came by and said, hey, I'll sell your frame. So he took them out. He got an order for $1,000, and our problem was we couldn't fill that order, so we went to the bank with a PO and said, would you loan us a little more money so we can make this order? And one thing led to another, and so that we did that for two years. You had uh, to move out of your living room. Yeah, had to move out of the living room, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And so, because that's where they were, they were in our home. In then 1972, we decided to open the first Hobby Lobby, and it was uh, 300 square feet. And back in 1972, a lot of people were doing macrame and putting those in their home oh, and yeah. all of that. <laughs> and so we had a bunch of macrame, and, uh, and then we put the frames in the back. And so we still do the frames today. So we still have the company Greco, which makes our frames. Uh, but my dad's passion really was uh, retail. And so in 1975, after my mom had run the business for five years, she never got paid for the first five years. You know, that's the way businesses start. You have to make sacrifices. My dad was making 32000 a year, and so he decided to cut his salary in half and make 16000 a year and see if he could make a go of it for himself. So that's, so I was, you know, about 14 by then. So yeah, I was a young person. We just saw it grow ripe in our family. It's, it was part of our family. My sister works in the business. My brother does, my brother-in-law. So it's been a family business since 1970. How many stores? Hobby Lobby. Stores. Yeah, Hobby Lobby, uh, we're over 600. We're opening 70 this year, so it changes every week. So somewhere between 600 and 650. Uh, yeah, you know, it's right too cute. You start with $600 and you've got 600 stores today. Yeah. I just love that. <laughs> there you go. Now, uh, well, your faith foundation as a family is well known. And clearly there was a higher purpose even in what your parents applied themselves to. Tell us a little about that. Yeah, my father's story, he was a preacher's kid, and uh, they were in Pentecostal uh, charismatic church and just little bitty churches on the other side of the tracks, never more than 50 in the congregation, and, and they were eight of the 50 because my, my, my father has five siblings, uh, and all five of them are preachers or married preachers, and so grandmother really wanted six preachers. So uh, for them, missionary was the top, pastor was second, and business was way down here, you know, uh, as far as ministry and stuff. And so, but while my dad didn't get the preaching gift, and he would have been a very good preacher probably, but uh, he was, he loved business, and he loved giving, and that was through my grandmother. My grandmother would sew little doilies back in the day, and my grandfather said, no, Marie, why are you sewing these doilies? She says, oh, the missions offering's coming. I want to give him the missions offering. He says, well, I'm, I'm giving. She says, no, I want my own missions offering. And so uh, my dad says if nobody bought her doily, she bought her own doily just so she would have a missions offering. And so, uh, so sweet. even though he didn't have shoes to go to school in and some, you know, didn't have a lot of things, she still would give. Another thing she did was she felt like she should pay tithes on her increase so she didn't worry about pre-tax or post-tax. Uh, so if you gave my grandmother a gift, she figured out what its value was and paid tax on it, I mean tax, ties on it, because she felt like that was an increase. And so uh, again, I'm sure it wasn't much, you know, but it wasn't the size of the gift, it was the size of the sacrifice. So I had a little fun. We, we gave our largest gift ever to Oral Roberts University not too long ago, about five or six years ago. And so I asked my dad, now dad, have we outgiven grandma yet? He said, oh no, no son. 
Grandma always gave out of what she didn't have. We've always given out of what we do have and our excess and stuff like that. So, uh, but that living example of living the faith out, she didn't preach it, she didn't talk it, but my dad saw that. And so he didn't get the preaching gift, he got the generosity gift. I may be stretching this, but you know, this family, your family, the Hobby Lobby, the Green family uh, is recognized as the largest philanthropist from the evangelical community in the world. And I wonder if we have Grandma to thank for that. Yep, absolutely. Marie a, a Green. Model. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Precious. So, living the faith. As was my grandfather, my, pa my mother's parents were raised believers. And so, um, so anyways, an incredible legacy that we have. So, it's a responsibility that we carry. And so, uh, and not everybody has legacy. My grandfather actually came from a non Christian home that married Marie. Marie, my grandmother, was a preacher. And really? So she was preaching. And my, my, my grandfather went to her service and got saved. The one and, that made doilies was also a preacher. Yeah, she was a preacher. As a matter of fact, that's how she met her husband. And he was not a believer, came from a non-Christian home, so didn't have a legacy, was going to be a dancer. And uh, his family never spoke to him again after that, after he became a Christian and married Marie and stuff like that. So, you know, legacy is something that sometimes you have an incredible legacy. I have an incredible legacy to share. But sometimes you have no legacy, but we all can start a legacy. And so no matter where you're at, so Marie Green had no idea that what she would do. She died very poor, so she left no inheritance. If you take a, inheritance being money, money, but she left an incredible legacy. All of her kids serve the Lord, all of her grandkids, all her great grandkids still serve the Lord. And so, and she actually saw angels. She said, oh, I see them coming, and then she died. And so, oh, you know, lose me. did she die poor? <laughs> oh, abundant so, uh, fruit. Yeah. Martin, you need to write a book. <laughs> oh, I love, I could just get lost in this story. It's so yeah. beautiful. Well, it's a, God's um, faithfulness. Wow, it, it's also really beautiful to read the, the Hobby Lobby credo, how you run a Christ-centered a, a, a business with Christian values, honoring the Lord in all we do by operating the company in a manner consistent with biblical values. I wonder what that's like for an employee. Yeah, well, we hope it's a, a place of integrity, it's a place that they're treated well and all that. Not all the people who work for us are believers, of course, or Christians, they don't have to be. We want them to be a place that they say, wow, this is a place of excellence. And so, you know, we think Christians should be excellent. And so that's why for my dad, he was convicted, you know, he always felt a little second class as a businessman. Till one time he made a faith gift. He really felt God told him to give somebody $30,000. And it was like, oh my, I don't have $30,000 to give. So he actually told, he said, I will give you four checks for 7,500, August, September, October, November. Please don't cash them until I call you. But if I have it, it's yours, you know? And uh, on the plane trip back from that, even before God provided, God convicted my dad that he wasn't second class. You know, God needs all kinds of people. He needs people in retail. He needs people in all professions. So Hobby Lobby is our ministry. We don't consider ourselves second class. And so, but it took that experience, and God did provide, of course, you know, and he was able to give that gift, and he's not stopped giving since then. So uh, Hobby Lobby is our ministry. We don't consider ourselves non-ministry. It is full-time ministry for us. Powerful lessons on giving. You were just 19 when you established Mardell. Tell us what that is. Yeah, Mardell is a Christian in education, so it's a full-line Christian bookstore as well as a full-line education store. And I was at college, and I actually love learning. Where my dad, school just wasn't his thing. I mean, sitting in a chair and learning wasn't it. He was just had street smarts, common sense, unbelievable. Obviously, to build a business like he has. I love learning, I love school, but he talked about, and he's an entrepreneur, he's a dreamer, and he had talked about opening barbecue stands and different things, none of those attracted me. But when he talked about a Christian bookstore, thinking about his mother having to do doilies, well maybe churches could do bookstores as a fundraiser or something. All I knew is I loved retail, and I thought, wouldn't that be neat that not only would the business be a backdoor ministry, you know, be able to give, but every day people come into Christian bookstores with hurts and pains and all those kind of things, looking for something, looking for answers, or trying to help somebody else. And so I thought, wow, wouldn't that be neat, you know, to do that? So I called my dad the next day and said, hey, Dad, what about that idea? He says, well, if you want to start it, I'll, I'll help you get a loan. Because it's easier for me to get help for a loan than his. I got a little more than $600 to start because he had a little bit of assets. But he only had maybe four or five Hobby Lobbies at the time. So looking back, I realized he took a risk of his business because he signed off. Because at 19, they're not loaning me any money right. based on my assets. And so, but I felt that the weight of that pressure that I didn't want to have to go back and say I defaulted on that loan. So, uh, so it's been a great pleasure of mine to be in the Christian retail for the last 30 some years. 2005 Bookstore of the Year Award from the Christian Book Association for setting standards of excellence in the industry. Mart, I'm not sharing something everyone isn't aware of, and that is the challenge 
for Christian bookstores in this uh, digital online era. Yes. Uh, are you experiencing that? Yes, we are. Obviously, our music sales have been impacted in books, and so we're just having to find new ways, new products, Christian lifestyle. Uh, the education helps us with diversity of products, So, but it's a challenge we're all going to have to face, and uh, there's great news on it, just like God's Word's going out on Bible apps like never before, so I'm excited about that. Uh, so we just have to learn to do new business in new ways, and so it's a challenge for our team, but uh, used to us in the office of Belay Business, and we phased out of that when, when the office supply industry changed. So business is about change, and we're learning how to change with it. Well, I want to talk about Christian education as we close this segment. Uh, Oral Roberts University um, has you to thank uh, on a lot of levels. You just stepped down as chair of the Board of Trustees, vice chair currently, and you have invested so much to keep that a vibrant and viable institution. How's Christian education? How, how's the future looking for young people choosing a Christ-centered education? Well, I think it's an important part of a young person's life to grow up, to get a Christian education in that time of your life when you're trying to figure out where your future is and all that, you're on your own. So I really encourage people, even if it's just one year, go to a Christian higher education that first year and do that. But there's challenges in all areas. Again, with the digital world there, the, the Christian education has to learn how to perform in that situation. But in our world now, we need more leaders who understand a Christian worldview. And what I loved about Oral Roberts is he said, go into every person's world. And they had a law school and it said, lawyers are healers too. So he understood that it was more than just the missionary and the pastor, but everybody could be a healer. A retailer, like my dad, could be a healer. So I thought, you know, if my dad had gone to ORU, he wouldn't have felt second class as a businessman because Oral's passion was to go into every person's world. We all can be healers. You know, even though he was a physical healer and had that aspect, he realized, where do you go when you have a problem? Sometimes you go to a lawyer. And what if your lawyer saw themselves as a healer? You know, and that, just that uh, mentality, I think, is what's neat. And that's what we're trying to do at Oral Roberts University, raise up students to go into every person's world. Well, I don't know how you do it all. It's truly amazing. We have to have two parts here because first I owe you a great big thank you for one of the ways you're going into all the world. And I think people are gonna be just, uh, they're gonna be blown away to hear about what you're doing in media and in taking the gospel to the whole world. So, uh, Mart Green, can we do this again? Yeah, I'd love to, let's part do it. <laughs> you're not gonna to wanna to miss it. <laughs>